The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Dark Matter Zone discovered halfway between Mars and Three Musketeers, leather-bound tomes and magical mobsters, plus part 10 of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We've got an interview with Ben Bova and Les Johnson, co-authors of New Bain Hardcover Rescue Mode this time. The interview is a really thought-provoking, free-ranging discussion of the whys and wherefores of exploring the solar system and sending a manned expedition to Mars. Les is a NASA scientist, although he's with us today as author Les Johnson, and Ben is the many times president for the National Space Society, so they have some well-formed opinions on the subject. And we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic as read by Bronson Pinchot. But first, here's the news. Hey, out right now is the limited, signed, leather-bound edition of David Weber's second Honor Harrington novel, The Honor of the Queen. This is the 21st anniversary edition, and it's a really beautiful leather hardcover signed by David. These are limited, and they will go fast, so get it while you can. We're going to have lots of Weber news coming up, including an in-depth interview with David Weber, talking about The Honor of the Queen at 21. The Honor Harrington comic book series is out there as well, with book three debuting. The series is called Tales of Honor. I've read the first two, and they are really nicely done by an outfit out in California called Top Cow. Good version of Honor in the uh, art there, too. Maybe not the Nimitz you imagine, but I like I liked the way they did him. You can find out about the comic, the out-based game, and the movie at talesofhonor.com, with hyphens between the words, talesofhonor.com, that is. So check that out, and look for the signed, limited, leather-bound edition of Honor of the Queen at your favorite science fiction bookseller. I want to welcome Ben Bova and Les Johnson to the podcast. Hello, Ben and Les. Hello, Tony. Hey, Tony. Ben Bova has written more than 120 futuristic novels and nonfiction books and has been involved in science and high technology since the very beginnings of the space age. President Emeritus of the National Space Society and a past president of Science Fiction Writers of America, Bova also received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation in 2005 for, quote, fueling mankind's imagination regarding the wonders of outer space. He's the winner of six Hugo Awards. His articles, opinion pieces, and reviews have appeared in Scientific American, Nature, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and many other newspapers and magazines. Earlier, he was an award-winning editor at Analog and Omni Magazine, and an executive in the aerospace industry. For Bain, he's the author of the excellent, humorous short story collection Laugh Lines, which you should check out. His latest solo novel is Mars Incorporated, The Billionaire's Club, from Bain, and now, with Les Johnson, he's the co-author of near-future interplanetary space epic Rescue Mode. Les Johnson is the co-author of two Bain novels, Back to the Moon with Travis S. Taylor and Rescue Mode with Ben Bova. He is the editor with Jack McDivitt of Bain's wonderful science fact science fiction anthology, Going Interstellar. Les is also the author of several science fact books. He is also the deputy manager of the Advanced Concepts Office at the NASA George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, one of the coolest day jobs ever. So, uh, did I get all that right, gentlemen? <laughs> Yes, yes, you did. You left a few things out, but that's okay. My God, we would be here for the rest of the day if I got them all in. <laughs> so uh, well, let's talk about rescue mode. Uh, as Senator Donaldson in the book might say, what's the point of going to Mars? Why do we, uh, why do we have a story here to begin with? I think it's just basic biological urge. The, the human race has been explorers for a long, long time. We have moved across the whole face of the Earth, and now with our technology, we're moving into space. 
there's I, I believe there are at least four human beings right now living aboard the International Space Station. And I don't think we'll ever see a time again when the entire human race lives on the surface of this one planet. We're going back to the moon, and Mars is beckoning. It's, it's the most Earth-like planet we can see, and it's just intriguing. What is there? Was there life on Mars at one time? Is there life there now? Um, it's got a lot to teach us, and we are curious folks. Well, the secondary question then, and maybe Les uh, can jump in as well, is um, why humans? Why not just go there with robots? Oh. Well, I guess to, to jump in, I, I guess what I would say is I think it's even beyond the curiosity question of going to Mars. I think we're going to have to go off planet to survive and to thrive. I mean, this is a great place to live, and it's the only place we know of that humans can live unencumbered and enjoy the environment. But, you know, if we want to protect the planet and make sure we have prosperity for all 7 billion people on the planet, I think it's inevitable that we're going to have to go to space for energy and for resources, and that's going to be an ever-expanding sphere of economic influence. It's going to reach out from Earth orbit to the moon, to the asteroid belt, to Mars, and ultimately to another star. So... It's, uh, it's exploration first, it's curiosity first, but I think it will soon move into necessity and we have to go just to survive. I agree entirely with you, but for the particular case of Mars, I don't see it as a place for resources. Um, I think the real interest in Mars is the possibility of extraterrestrial life being there. Either being there or having been there, I agree with you. And, and right. I think before we mm -hmm. start thinking about doing any kind of, of long-term modification to Mars, which is far, far in the future, we've got to get that scientific question answered. I agree. Yes, yes. It should be a, uh, a, a nature preserve until we prove it's okay. Well, as long as I get to camp out there sometime. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Bring your thermal underwear. <laughs> I think you'll need it. Uh, well, all right, so that's the why. It's It's got both a philosophical and practical component to it. Um, so how how was, how'd was you do it in the book? What does the ship, the arrow, look like? How does it work? How are we sending people out? Well, that's, that's Les's area. He's the engineer. <laughs> well, hey, I, I guess the way I would think of it is, you know, the arrow is kind of a, a composite ship of a lot of the studies that have been done over the last you know, 30 to 50 years of how we might send people to Mars. You're, you're going to need some kind of way to to, uh, to get people there in a propulsion kind of sense, and we chose uh, what what I think is the, the most efficient, best way to reduce the amount of mass we have to lift from Earth to go, which is nuclear thermal propulsion, which would use the same kind of energy production that you use in a nuclear power plant here on Earth, but instead of generating power with it, you'd have it as a heat source and use that to to basically uh, use that to heat your exhaust propellant, which is hydrogen, and basically have that as your propulsion system. And the reason the Aero name was chosen is because you're, you're going to want to have the ship look kind of like a dumbbell. You're going to want to have the, the nuclear reactor and the propulsion system at one end, have a long truss structure to separate the crew from that. And on the other end of that truss structure, you'll put the habitat uh, in which the people and the crew will live for the voyage, and then the whole thing would slowly rotate to, to give you partial gravity so that you don't have the decay of the, of the, of the bones and the muscles that people would experience uh, from long-duration weightlessness. So that's uh, kind of the genesis of the name, the arrow, because it kind of looks like an arrow. It sounded better than the dumbbell, right, or the extended dumbbell. And that's, <laughs> that's the way the ship was kind of configured. So. I agree that Arrow is much better public relations-wise than Dumbbell. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it, I'm trying to picture the the propulsion system is is also spinning along with the on the other end of the dumbbell. That's right. Yeah, just yeah, imagine that you've end. got a yeah, it's at one end. And remember, the propulsion system doesn't operate the whole trip. That's the key. The the, the nuclear thermal, as in any other kind of uh, high impulse system is basically going to burn early on to get you away from Earth. It's called trans-Mars injection. And what that means is you're using that thrust to get out of the Earth's gravity and get the speed up so that essentially you then coast for the next eight months or nine months on your way to Mars. Uh -huh. 
So it's like uh, a real you're not arrow. thrusting the whole way. That's right. Just yeah, like a real arrow. like a real arrow. You, you, you give it a big push ah. at the beginning, and it, it coasts the rest of the way. So when it's spinning, there's no propulsion, there's no acceleration going on. It's already got what it's got until you get to Mars. That's correct. Ah. That's right. There's also something else headed toward the arrow in the book. Uh, and we meet that thing in, in the very beginning of the prologue. What happens when small space debris or, uh, or, or a rock, in this case, uh, runs into something like the arrow? It nearly destroys the spacecraft and nearly kills the people on board. Mm. And the story of rescue mode really is how those people survive with some help from Earth in the form of information, but mainly with their own ingenuity and their own skills. Mm -hmm. Because there's no cavalry coming. As a matter of fact, back on Earth, political forces have canceled the rest of the Mars program. There's not even a backup Mars mission scheduled anymore. So these six people are on their own in that spacecraft halfway between Earth and Mars. Once you're, once you're on a voyage like this, you kind of get to a point where there's, there's really no return. Er, early in the mission, well, let me back up. Remember, everything's moving. Right, the Earth moves around the Sun. Mars is moving around the Sun, and and when you're launching toward Mars, you're not really launching toward the planet. You, you're launching toward a, a position in empty space, and you're planning to arrive there at the same time that Mars arrives there. Right, so you're really traveling on this arc that takes you out uh, toward the orbit where Mars is going around the Sun, and the complicating factor is is that early on. You might have enough propellant if something goes wrong to turn the ship around and come home, but after uh, a period of time, it could be weeks or months, depending on the year that you launch, you can't carry enough fuel to come home, and you're committed for the full two- to three-year mission, depending on the opportunity to go there, stay there for an amount of time, and come back, because you can't carry enough fuel for all of the options. It's not like Star Trek. You know, where we have this infinite energy drive, essentially, that lets you just point and go. you got to plan ahead, and, and after a certain point, you're committed, and you got to go. And the resources to come back are have been being produced there. The unmanned vehicles have landed on Mars ahead of the Mars crew, and uh, the resources are waiting for them on the surface of Mars. Which is quite the conundrum <laughs> if you're if you're on a damaged spacecraft that you're afraid is, isn't even going to make it. What does it mean to be between Earth and Mars? I mean, give us a sense of the just the physical vastness. Well, in at, you know, Mars averages some 35 million miles away from Earth, and the spacecraft, the Arrow, is more or less in the middle of that emptiness. There's nothing out there. I mean, it's empty. Vacuum of space. Almost empty. It's almost, <laughs> almost empty, or we wouldn't have had a story. Once in a while, <laughs> right. Once in a while, a little piece of rock will come by and break your spacecraft in half. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, it's, it's pretty empty. Yeah, and that's the thing about planning these kind of missions. The chances are you're not going to hit something. You know, m most likely if you're just playing the odds, it's going to be a smooth trip, and and you really don't have to worry any about much of anything after you get out of Earth orbit. In Earth orbit, yeah, but that makes for a great novel. <laughs> it sure does. And 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 but the point I was going to make is that the probability is really low, but it's not zero. And and whenever yeah. you take a send a spacecraft out there, it's it's a probability game. And, and you're saying, you know, I've got a 99.8% chance that I'm not going to hit anything. That's good enough. Let's go. Well, that's not a 0% chance you're not going to hit anything. And one of these days we're going to get unlucky with a robotic ship or hopefully not a crude ship like in our story, and it's going to get hit. Exploring a new frontier, you, you're going to get casualties. I think it was John Campbell who said exploration is, is really a, a new way of finding ways to kill yourself. Well, yeah, if you look at the history of exploration, a, a lot of people die. Uh, you know, they don't set out yep. to do it. They think they're prepared. They they often aren't. Yep. They, uh, the nature doesn't cooperate. and uh, But ultimately, there are enough people who go that, you know, most frontiers have eventually been settled, and, and that's been overcome. 
but it's not been without its casualties on the way. And uh, we can't become so risk averse that we're afraid to, to do anything because of a chance that someone will die. And I, and I know a lot of people, uh, I've met a lot of astronauts who, who, I mean, that's the risk they live with. And as long as we do everything reasonable we can, uh, you know, both commercial space as well as governments around the world to keep them safe, you know, you go in spite of the risk. It's, it's you know, there's a risk benefit. General George Patton once said of his troops in the Army, that don't mourn the ones that died. Congratulate them for having lived. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the the attitude we have to have about exploration. People are going to get killed. It is dangerous. But thank God there are people willing to do it and willing to explore, to push the envelope, to make a bigger and better environment for the human race. Speaking of those particular people and the the psychological types they might be, um, tell us about the crew, the characters that we meet in rescue mode. Are they selected for being this kind of person or self-selected? No, they're selected by a a board of uh, NASA experts, psychologists, mostly, and uh, I think to a large extent, you can you can weed out the nutcases and the the people who'd be difficult to live with, but it's hard to really get inside somebody uh, and understand how they react in a stressful situation. Well, it just just imagine getting you and your your closest uh, group of, of friends. Uh, men and women, or, or whatever mix you want to have, and you get in a an RV like a Winnebago, and you say, "Hey, this is great. Let's go on this two and a half year road trip, and we're never going to step outside of the Winnebago. We're going to stay in here together for the two and a half years, and everything we have to have for the trip, we have to bring with us in terms of supplies. And if you get sick of somebody, you can't just open the door and walk out. You're stuck." I mean, that would be incredibly stressful, and that's what astronauts on these really long voyages are going to encounter. I mean, just, just I, I can't think of, you know, five or six friends that I'd want to be stuck inside an RV with for two and a half years, personally. Um, <laughs> it would be hard. Yep. Without giving too many spoilers away, how do the there are men and women as well, um, and you posit some examples of how... Uh, that mix of people will, uh, and, and there's two alpha males on board as well. They they respect each other, but but they both have their issues. Um, tell us how um, that that mix uh, develops as as this horrible stressful situation hits them, because that's really the heart of the book. Most of these people uh, perform very well under stress. In fact, uh, stress brings out the best in them. Most of them, um, without giving away the plot or any of the details, uh, there certainly are conflicts among the people, and also uh, romance. Uh, going over two or three years without sex is not my idea of a jolly time, <laughs> but um, that's what's going on, at least at the outset. Things change, and the possibility of imminent death sort of focuses your mind very, very well on what you really want out of life, what's left of it. And I, and I think we can't forget that, that even though these people have been looked at by uh, either NASA or their respective countries, because this is kind of an international mission, people are also selected for this, not only the basis of their suitability, but each, you know, the countries that participate may have reason to have a particular person mm-hmm. on board versus someone else. And uh, you mentioned the the alpha males. Uh, I would say there's more than two on the ship, um, and there there is a, a strong, you know, they all have the reasons for wanting to be there, and sometimes that reason for being there may overcome some common sense <laughs> in terms of the decisions <laughs> made. Right? Uh, I mean, think yep. about it. Think be the first people to to actually visit, explore, and walk on another world. Uh, you know, you'd be pretty driven to do that, and if some things happen in your personal life or otherwise before you left, you might be tending to want to minimize that or hide it so that it doesn't, you know, negatively affect your ability to be on the ship. That's right. I think it was Scott Carpenter, the original uh, um, 
NASA seven astronauts. When he applied, he saw that the height limit was six feet tall, and Scott was six one. So in the form, he put down five feet thirteen inches. <laughs> That's the way some people <laughs> fiddle around with the rules, and he got away with it. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't know that. I've just learned something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Authority is. Well, the. Uh, Not sure it was Scott, but it was one of them. <laughs> well, the as, aside from psychological types, there's also different specialists that get sent along. Um, what particular specialties do you think absolutely will be uh, essential on such a trip? I think geologists, certainly. Uh, we have. Uh, one bio biologist on board the ship, and she's worried that she, she'll have nothing to do uh, if there's no biological activity on Mars. But part of her job is to ascertain whether there is or not. A negative answer would be just as important as a positive one in this case. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll want to have uh, somebody to watch after crew health, a doctor, and we have a doctor on board. Yes. And uh, yep. uh, you're also going to have to have your, your, your astronauts who know how to uh, fly the ship and, and probably do some engineering maintenance and things like that if anything happens. So it's going to have to be a mix of those that are going to get them there and keep people alive. But what's important upon a mission like this that kind of distinguishes it somewhat from what we did in Apollo is that you have more scientists going. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Harrison Schmidt was the only, quote, scientist that walked on the moon. The rest were... Uh, yeah. pilots, maybe some engineers, but, you know, you, you need to get this to the point where you, you have not only the people that can keep things running, but if this is a truly extended mission of exploration for scientific reasons, looking for life or signs of life, you want to make sure you get some scientists there. Exactly. And getting back to a question asked earlier, the robots versus people, uh, I think going to Mars, you're going to, it's going to be important to have people they can notice things that the robots don't. Automated machinery, robotic machinery, can answer questions that you already know how to ask. But people can find new questions and bring up new knowledge. And they're worth their weight in whatever it takes to, to bring them there. Well, this the story itself is um, is proof of that concept because no robot would it, would have been able to save itself after this. Um, disaster. Yeah, and it wouldn't care. Yeah. People wouldn't <laughs> care. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There's, um, there's a point in the story where it's possible that they're going to be in free fall for months and months, and I was wondering if it's even possible to survive that long. Well, the yes. answer is yes. Uh, it's tough. I mean, there are going to be biological effects from that, but, but right now, we, we've had astronauts on board the space station uh, longer than a year. There was a, uh, and not just on our space station, but on Mir, if I remember correctly, there was an astronaut who was on the Mir uh, when the Soviet Union broke apart. So he launched when yeah. it was the Soviet Union, and he came home to Russia. And yes. uh, he, was, he was up there for over a year, and when they landed, he actually had to be carried out of the capsule because his muscles had gotten so weak he couldn't walk. We sort of have the wrong attitude about this. What happens in zero gravity, in weightless conditions? Your body adapts to the environment in which it finds itself. The human body is adapting to weightlessness. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you return to a planet's yeah. surface, you know, you have to live... With, in a gravity field, and you've got to readapt to that. But as far and, and that, as that, being in space itself, the body is adapting to the environment in which it's living. And that's really a risk for, for sending a crew to someplace like Mars for the first time, because if you're out in space for nine months and your muscles get weak, your bones are also getting a little bit more brittle. It's kind of an osteoporosis-like yep. effect. And so not only are you more likely to fall, you're more likely to break something if you do. But the good thing is, is uh, the muscle part of it can be partially overcome, mostly overcome through rigorous exercise. Uh, if you if you work through four hours a day, which nobody really likes, <laughs> you know, they all hate it. That's right. But if you do it, it'll keep your muscles strong. And there may be some, at least by the time the 2020s get here, there's a lot of promising research and osteoporosis research to keep the the bone strength up. So 
you know, I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. It, it, at, at, at worst, it is a, a real, you know, a threat for when you get there, and at best, it's just an annoying inconvenience. It would be a huge problem, wouldn't it, if the powers that be lost the political will will to carry through on a mission, right? Right when we have men and women on the way out, there's there's some heroics that might uh, need to go into place there as well. Uh, politicians are always worried about what's urgent rather than what's important. And we, in in rescue mode, we have a president who is pushing for Mars exploration. He sees it not just as a scientific effort, but as a way of bringing together the peoples of Earth. But there's powerful political opposition, and the accident that threatens the lives of these uh, explorers is ammunition for those who are against space exploration, saying that it's too dangerous. So there's fireworks in Washington just as much as there is on board the spacecraft. Well, and, and I think, you know, there, there's one other thing that would be that I, I'd like to point out, and that is there is this perception that uh, space exploration and sending to people to Mars is, is going to be prohibitively expensive. And, and there is no doubt that, you know, in the scale of we as individuals do things, it's not going to be cheap. But on the scale of what gun countries and companies spend money on, it's, it's really not that expensive. I mean, you can look at the, the amount of money that the United States spends on space exploration, and it's it's some $17 billion a year just for NASA. Um, and, but that's out of a $3 trillion budget. That's $3,000 billion. And we spend seventeen people, out of 3000 on space. And, and people think we spend a lot more than that. And, and it's really, yeah, it's a lot of money for you and me, but in the scale of things that governments do, it's not that much. The American I mean, people I'm not trying spend to more money on pizza. No, no. That's right. The people of the United States spend more money on pizza than they do on space. You're right. We should put this in perspective. And look what we get back for it. Look at the new knowledge, the new technologies, the capabilities. Uh, I live on, on the beach of the Gulf of Mexico, and I see kids out there uh, wind sailing. The fabrics they use for those sails originated with NASA research. We have smartphones and a whole panoply of electronic devices. If it weren't for the space program, program in particular for uh, Apollo, none of that would have been developed. We have gotten more money out of space by factors of 10 or 100 than we've ever put into space. Well, and I would I would make the case, and in fact, to be a shameless plug for one of my popular science books, I mean, I, I wrote a book called Sky Alert, When Satellites <laughs> Fail, and it's a pop science book, but the, the basis of the book is to kind of kind of let people understand that not only have we gotten benefits from space exploration and technologies, but I think our, our country, our society is dependent on space technology today. And, and it's, a, it's a necessary part of our economic engine that's invisible to most people. And it's not necessarily NASA. I mean, it's, it's commercial companies that are providing a lot of these services as well as governments. But it's running in the background and it's helping to make our, 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 our country economically, militarily, and politically function. And people don't even realize it's there. But I think we're yes. dependent on it. And, and, and expanding our sphere of influence beyond Earth to go to the moon and eventually go to Mars, it's just something we've got to do. And I think we will do it unless we consciously choose not to. Well, that's gonna. That was my next question. Do you it's will a human it. being step set foot on Mars? What's it's going to take time. Um, I don't see it happening within the next uh, fifteen to twenty years. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, I, I think it could. There's no engineering reason or, or physiological reason that says we can't do it. I think that the uh, policymakers somewhere in the world, whether it's the U.S., China. Uh, Europe, a mixture, Russia, you know, I don't know, somebody, if they decide to do it, yeah, they can do it. We have the capability to go build and, and execute a Mars mission. Let me put in a shameless plug for my novel, Mars Incorporated. We have enough billionaires in the United States to fund a manned Mars mission out of their pocket change. And the novel Mars Incorporated is about just that, Get, getting those billionaires to open up their pockets a little bit 
and produce a privately funded Mars program. Yeah, and it, it wouldn't even be that much in comparison to what Facebook is paying for buying some tech startup. You could send a part of a mission to Mars. I think you, you hit the nail on the head, uh, Les. We, we think of our space expenditures as enormous, but they're really a very small part of the overall national budget. And they, they, they give us back much, much more than we spend. Well, and this is the point where I have to put in that caveat that, you know, when I write my books and I'm giving interviews like this or talking on podcasts, I am talking as a private citizen, not representing NASA, although I work for NASA. So now I've, now I've, had, now I've got my disclaimer in because, really, these are all my personal <laughs> opinions, and I feel pretty strongly about them. Um, anyway, enough said. Actually, probably not enough. I think I need to tell more people about what we ought to be doing, but enough for now. Yeah. So we could say some of the employees of NASA believe that we ought to go to Mars, but NASA doesn't have an official position on this. Well, actually, they do. I mean, that's if you. Uh, President Obama has said that that's the the goal of our SpaceX space program in the 2030s is to send people to Mars. So that that has been a, a stated goal that I've heard. Uh, from from this administration as the long term goal. Now you know are we are we you know laying in plans to do that? I'll leave that for somebody else to answer. But it is it is officially the goal. Say it's pushed far enough into the future so that no politician now serving has to worry about losing his seat over whether we go to Mars or not. Could y'all speculate on what you think? Um, what what could be the political maneuver that would get the uh, a space agenda back in in the realm of reality rather than oh we wish we could do that i think the uh, move toward privatization is important and i do think the first mars mission will probably be at least in part a privately funded operation i, I look at it as is one there are several ways it could happen you know, I, I think that Mars is, is a logical step in the progression outward, and, and if we can go to space and there's a profit to be made, as Ben said, you're not going to be able to stop people from going. Um, if the killer app for space is there, whether that be space solar power, whether that be asteroid mining, we're going to see people go. And, and the more people we see go, the less expensive is it going to be to do everything else in space. It's like any other economy. You know, the, the, the more rockets you fly, the cheaper it is per flight, and that means more people can fly, which means the flight rate goes up and it gets cheaper still. It's like cars. The first car off the assembly line and a new design that GM puts out costs about $3 billion, but they don't make one car and sell it for $3 billion. They make hundreds of thousands of cars, and therefore they're affordable. And, and I think it's the same here. As soon, as soon as, you know, more money is being made, the flight rate will go up, more people will go, and it'll make it even cheaper. So I kind of see it as a bootstrapping thing economically to go. Now, now for science, you know, if one of these rovers that we have there or a future laboratory finds signs of life, I think there'll be a huge clamor to send something more capable than the rovers and the robots we have now to go analyze that and maybe, maybe bring back samples to study. I mean, that'd be the most exciting discovery ever. No, I think you're perfectly right. But both of you, because of the the kind of characters you put in this book, you think human the humans still have it in them that we have the we have the drive and the ability if if we get the will. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. And we have we have the will too, but the will is lacking in Washington. Hmm. Uh, the politicians only do what what they consider to be urgent and what will get them reelected. We have got to organize our politics so that elections depend on what we do in space. Boy, wouldn't that be a change. <laughs> it would. So everybody should join the National Space Society. Indeed, indeed. We, <laughs> we need a, a, an electorate that's informed and active. The book is Rescue Mode, and it's by Ben Bova and Les Johnson. It's available at booksellers everywhere. Ben and Les, thank you so much for being with us. Good to be with you, Tony. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us, and uh, we're we're uh, looking forward to getting together and talking about how we actually make this happen. That's the next step. 
And now here is part 10 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what has gone before. It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that's been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents. In each generation, more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their powers for good, but some do not. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's also a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy. He's the type of active that controls the force of gravity. Jake is good at that. After working for J. Edgar Hoover's Bureau of Investigation and getting thrown out of a dirigible for his trouble, Jake is perplexed why he was sent to capture Delilah Jones, a brute who was accused of working with the mob. Who best to ask about that than the Godfather himself? It doesn't hurt that Jake had a hand in saving his butt during World War I. Here is Bronson Pinchot with Part 10 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Chicago, Illinois Jake Sullivan had slept most of the last couple of days trying to shake his miserable cold. He still felt like death warmed over when he walked out that evening. He didn't know his way around the city, so he hailed a cab outside his hotel. Staying in hotels had gotten to be second nature. He did not really have a home, other than a ten-dollar-a-month rented room on top of a diner in Detroit. It was a place to sleep, stash some guns, his library, and served as his office, not that he'd had many regular clients lately. The money was tight for everyone, even for wives who would normally want their husbands tailed to check for mistresses. His only real work recently had been standing around intimidating the striking labor lines at the UBF factory and J. Edgar's assignments. Sure, there was always honest work to be had for a heavy. Somebody like him was worth five normals on a construction crew, but that seemed too much like breaking rocks, and Sullivan had already had his fill of breaking rocks. The cab smelled like Burma shave. Where to, buddy? When Sullivan had a question that he couldn't answer, it tended to just stick in his craw, bugging him, gnawing away until he figured it out. Hoover had lied to him and his own agents about Delilah, and he wanted to know why. Purvis had mentioned that she had been coming into town to do a job for the mob, so that was where he would start. Lenny Torrio's place. The speakeasy was in a warehouse near the new super dirigible station. For something that was supposed to be a secret, it sure was busy, especially on a Saturday evening. There were two dozen automobiles parked inside the fence, including some Packards and even an expensive Duesenberg. Plus there were three cabs waiting to drop off at the curb ahead of his and more coming up behind. The Chicago cops knew about this place, but the upper crust needed a place to kick back. Sullivan had traveled the country extensively since his parole. Prohibition was brutally enforced in some states, especially in the South and Midwest, and in others, not so much. It hadn't been that long ago that one eastern governor had promised to keep his state as wet as the Atlantic Ocean. The Eighteenth Amendment was a joke from the start, and most everyone outside Kansas knew it. It was just American nature that when some authority told you that you couldn't do something, that just made you want to do it all the more. Sullivan was not much of a drinker by nature, mostly because he was too cheap, and the only thing Prohibition had truly succeeded in doing was raising the price of booze. On the other hand, if somebody else was buying, he was in favor of violating the Volstead Act as much as the next guy. He followed a group of well-dressed men and women down the stairs to a large metal door. The others were far more presentable than he, the men in crisp $75 jackets and the dames in silk dresses with their hair in tight curls. Sullivan looked a little ragged since his good black suit had fallen through a train car, so all he had left was his old brown suit. 
and it had already been unfashionable when he'd bought it used for three dollars the day he'd gotten out of jail. He waited his turn while they gave the password, some of the rich kids giving him the crusty eyeball. The door opened and music spilled out. The sheiks went through the metal door and it clanged shut behind them. Sullivan waited a moment, then knocked. A slot opened and two beady eyes scoped him. Password? I need to talk to Mr. Torrio. The eyes looked him over suspiciously. You the law? Do I look like the law? Apparently. We got a dress code. The bar slid back into place. Sullivan just shook his head. He waited a moment and then knocked again harder this time. The slot opened. Password? Sullivan stuck a gold eagle through the hole. Tell Mr. Torrio that Sullivan from the first volunteer needs a minute of his time. The goon grumbled as he closed the peep. Sullivan pulled out his pack of smokes and settled down to wait. He had one on his lips when he remembered what the blonde, most likely a mender, had said on the stolen dirigible. She'd certainly got the part about picking up a cold right. These things were supposed to be good for you, but healers could see your insides. He frowned and put the cigarette back. Maybe that was why he was so spun up about this case. There were enough magicals around nowadays that you were bound to have some in gangs. With the times being so tough, there were four times as many people making a living from crime as there were from carpentry, so you were bound to have actives in there, too. They had to make a buck just like everybody else. But this crew that picked up Delilah had been different. They weren't just magical. They had all been hardcore actives. The German had shadow-walked while being tossed around when every other fade he knew could barely pull it off taking their time without getting stuck in the wall. The mouth and the mover had been better at their powers than any other he'd met. And the way the blonde had diagnosed him, she had to have been some sort of healer. And those were so rare, they were worth their weight in gold. Even a weak, passive healer could write their own ticket, so it didn't make any sense to have one slumming around in a gang. Sullivan's thoughts were interrupted when the door flew open. There were two burly toughs there, one leveled a Remington Model 8 rifle at his chest. The other had a Winchester pump and stuck it against his nose. Jake slowly raised his hands. Bad time, cause I can come back later. Mr. Torrio says he knew three Sullivans in the volunteers, the one with the shotgun said. Which one is you? Well, I ain't the dead one, so I guess I'm the pretty one, Sullivan answered. The goon pumped around into the shotgun's chamber for emphasis. Jake, Sergeant Jake Sullivan, the one that saved Lenny Sara ass as second sum. The goombas exchanged glances and finally the weapons were lowered. You's good. That's what he said you'd say. Mr. Torrio will see you now. He put one arm over Jake's shoulder and steered him into a long brick hallway. The door slammed behind. Welcome to the gridiron. The club was about the ritziest thing Sullivan had seen. The exterior was a crumbling warehouse, but the inside was a palace. The brick walls had been covered in blue and white curtains, and an actual chandelier had been hung from the rafters. There had to be fifty folks on the dance floor, and double that sitting along the bar, drinking themselves stupid on quality Canadian booze. The front of the space was filled with round tables and diners. The smell of fine cooking made Sullivan's stomach rumble. The waiters were even wearing tuxes. The back of the warehouse had a stage, and the music was both loud and good. A sparkling bridge spanned the stage over the band, darn near big enough to be an orchestra, and a long-legged dame was crooning a tune. She had great pipes. One goon had remained at the door, and the other led Sullivan along the wall and up a flight of metal stairs. A balcony circled the room, and once at the top they entered the private lounge, consisting of some leather couches overlooking Lenny Torrio's kingdom. There were tables in darkness along the back, and Sullivan could make out a few shapes behind the glow of cigarettes. 
he had entered the inner sanctum. There were two more muscle types camped at the top of the stairs. Jake saved them the trouble of the pat-down and handed over his spare gun. It was a beater, Smith & Wesson Military and Police 38, but he couldn't afford to replace his precious 45. I'm going to want that back, Jake stated as the guard carried the revolver away. Lenny Torrio was sprawled between two chippies in slinky gowns. He was wearing a red silk robe over his clothes. Sarge, how you been? He shouted in greeting. He snapped his fingers and the girls jumped up to leave. Get out of here. Can't you see I've got business to conduct? He smacked one on the rump as they hurried away. Have a seat. Have a seat. Sullivan settled his mass onto the couch across from Lenny. Physically, Lenny Torrio hadn't changed much. He was still a skinny, bug-eyed, hyperactive type. The con was going bald now, but he'd slicked what was left over to one side in a failing attempt to hide it. Hey, Lenny, been a long time. Sure has. You want a drink? He didn't wait for an answer, but clapped his hands. Yo, Amish, get my boy a drink. What are you waiting for? Lenny turned back to Sullivan and frantically rubbed his nose. Help these days. What can you do? Sullivan just nodded. Nice robe. You supposed to be Rudolph Valentino? Lenny cackled, way too hard, slapping his knee. You were always a crack-up, Sarge. Mr. Truth, Justice, and the American Way. Funny, huh? That I'm on top of the world, and last I heard, you were a slave to the feds. A pair of glasses and a bottle were placed on the table between them by a cross-eyed man who quickly hurried away. How's that treating you? Pays the bills. Good thing I'm a legitimate businessman. Lenny poured them both a drink. And Rockville, is it as tough as everybody says? Worse. Sullivan took the whiskey, pounded it down in one gulp, and set the glass back on the table. It burned going down. He'd never liked Torrio. The man was slime, always had been, always would be, and the only reason he'd been in the first was because a Brooklyn judge had given him the choice between serving his country or serving hard time, and for somebody like Torrio, that meant Rockville's special prisoner's wing. So, you talked to Matthew lately? So that was why his door goons had asked him which Sullivan he had been. Torrio had always been scared of Jake's big brother, and for good reason. He had been the meanest bastard in the first, after all. Sullivan shook his head. You don't want to go there. I ain't my brother's keeper. He changed the subject. Thanks for talking to me. Why, just because you'd sell your own kind out to the government, I'm not supposed to entertain an old friend? Sullivan let the dig flow off him like water off a duck's back. He didn't rile easy. My own kind? You mean crooks or actives? Torrio shrugged. Both. I heard why you went up river. So in your case, it's the same thing. Guys like us are better than everybody else. So you got made an example. You should know that better than anybody, Sarge. We should be running this show, not them. Normals just keep us down. Times are going to change, though, I tell you that. Sullivan nodded like Lenny was just full of wisdom. He was full of something, but it sure as hell wasn't wisdom. He scanned the room. The men at the tables weren't clearly visible, but they were far enough not to eavesdrop over the music. The one named Amish was standing with arms folded about ten feet away. I need some information. Sullivan paused, frowning as he sensed the intrusion. And tell your boy to get out of my head before I open his. Lenny was surprised that his man had been caught, but he played it like he was offended. He turned toward the cross-eyed man. Amish, are you trying to read my guest? Sorry, boss, the man replied sheepishly. Beat it, retard. Torrio threw his glass at the goon, missed, and it shattered on the far wall. The goon scurried away. Sorry about that, you know how it is. Yeah, I know how it is. He decided to get right to the point. I heard Delilah was coming to do a job for you. Who's asking, you or J. Edgar Hoover? Just me. Torrio shook his head. I got no idea what you're talking about. Sullivan leaned back on the couch. 
let the games begin. I can't afford to pay for information, Lenny. I don't give a damn about the government, and they don't know I'm here. I got lied to about Delilah, and I want to know why. I make my living by knowing what's going on, Sarge. That'd be like me asking you to, I don't know, lift something heavy for free. I saved your life. Torrio snorted. Are you kidding? You didn't go out of your way for just little old me. You saved everybody you could. I just happened to be one of them. You did happen to be one of them, Sullivan said. Remember that, and every time you look around your fancy club and your fancy halls and your fancy bows, you should remember that you should be too busy being dead to enjoy any of it. I worked hard for what I got. And you'd be fertilizing a field in France if I hadn't carried you on my back through a quarter mile of hell. The mobster seemed to think about that. You know, Sarge, the Chicago family could use a tough man like you. I just want to know about Delilah. You were sweet on her back before Rockville, weren't you? She sure was a babe. Lenny's teeth seemed too big when he smiled. Gotta be nice for a guy like you to have a girl that can't break by accident. Sullivan was tiring of this. Maybe it was just the cold giving him a headache. But he was about done with the mobster's nonsense. My business is none of your business. Torrio sighed. All right, for all time's sake. But then we're even, and I don't ever want to see you again. Capiche? Talking to somebody like you hurts my reputation. I show weakness, and that asshole Capone will run me out in a box. He paused to pour himself another shot, got confused as to where his glass had gone, so took Sullivan's instead. The grim noir was looking for her, but she was on the run. They paid me to find her. I got it to come out of hiding so they could pick her up. Looks like they did, though, from what I heard. You gave them one hell of a fight. The name meant nothing to him. What's a grim noir? The mobster downed his drink. Not noir, noir. You'd think you'd spend enough time in France to not butcher everything, but they ain't French as far as I can tell. That's just what they call themselves. I don't know who they are, real secret bunch. But they seem to know everybody, and their money is green, and there's lots of it. I think there's some sort of crew, but they're connected big time. What did they want with Delilah? Beats me. The one I talked to said they were on the same side and wanted to protect her. Delilah was hiding out up north. The law's been hunting her since she killed those lugs that went after her. The Chicago agents had been told the five mutilated corpses had belonged to innocent victims of her rampage. That had never sounded like Delilah's style. Who were they? Torrio looked at Sullivan like he was thick. He licked his teeth. You got no idea what you're getting into, do you? You know us heavies are dumb, Lenny. Humor me. They were men you don't want to cross, Sullivan. When they missed her, they stuck the law on her. Nobody messes with them. Not the feds, not the mob, not the army. They're bad news. That's all I'm saying. He thumped his glass back down and stood. You need to get out of here and stay out of this if you know what's good for you. Sullivan stayed seated. The couch was comfy. So, you told this grim the wild bunch which blimp Delilah would be on? Was that before or after you told the Bureau of Investigation? Lenny's face slipped for a second as he said that, and that second told Sullivan he had called it right. Torrio composed himself, playing offended. You calling me a snitch? The B.I. prefers the term informant, Sullivan smiled. How much was the reward on that? Here you are giving me lip about working for the man. At least I'm honest about it. I like to pick one side and stick to it. But you, you were always good at playing all the sides. Get out of my club. Torrio's robe whipped dramatically as he pointed at the stairs. Sullivan stood. See you around, Lenny. Lenny Torrio waited until Sullivan had picked up his piece and was escorted out before summoning his imp. The spindly little creature crawled out of the shadows under the couch and clambered onto the table, half monkey, 
half reptile, its bat face opened in a hideous grin of jagged black teeth as it waited for the evening's orders. Follow him, Lenny ordered. I want to know where he sleeps. The imp shrieked, leapt from the table and scurried up the bricks and out the nearest barely open window. Spreading leathery wings, it disappeared into the night. Lenny poured himself another shot as his guest inevitably joined him. The Oriental had been waiting patiently in the darkened recesses of the balcony. The man made Lenny uncomfortable because he just stood there like he was at attention or something. What? Will this man be an issue? His English was perfect. Jake Sullivan was probably the stubbornest, most single-minded, unwavering, bravest, and therefore dumbest son of a bitch Lenny had ever met. Probably. He was asking about your outfit, about those men the brute girl killed. What does he know? Not much. He hadn't even heard of the Grim Noir. The man nodded. So, you told him then? There was a thinly veiled threat in the words. Not about you people, of course, Lenny sputtered. I'm not stupid. Look, if I had known you wanted Delilah, I would have turned her over to you and not them. That wasn't my fault. I've got my sources looking for these grim noir people and the other two men you want. And as soon as I hear anything, you'll be the first to know. Your boss can take that to the bank. The Japanese man raised a single eyebrow. The chairman will be pleased to hear that, and you will be exceedingly well paid for your services. By the way... He reached into his suit and removed a heavy pouch. It clinked as it hit the table, and a few octagonal gold coins spilled out. Your source in California was correct. We found Traveling Joe, but we still desire something that was in his possession, part of a device. It was missing. Lenny nodded as he took the piece of paper, examining it briefly. It was part of a mechanical drawing way beyond his understanding. He stuck it in his robe with one trembling hand. I'll see what I can do. Lenny Torrio could find anyone or anything because that's what he did. That's what had made him a powerful man. He was the best finder in the business. Is there any chance that this man would be willing to be in the chairman's service? Hardly. Torrio laughed, then stifled it quickly. No offense intended, of course, but old Jake has always been set in his ways. He sees things real simple in black and white, and once he sets his course, you can't sway him. An admirable quality. Alert me when your demon returns. Your friend is too curious and will need to be dealt with. I will require the services of your staff. He bowed slightly before returning to his table. Lenny tried to pour himself another drink, but his hands were shaking too bad, and he spilled a bunch of the expensive hooch on the table. His old pal Sullivan had been right. He had a knack for playing more than one side. Unfortunately, he'd just been drafted by the worst side of all, and there wouldn't be any turning back now. Sorry, Sarge. He finally gave up and took a long drink from the bottle. This is just business. That was part 10 of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Edith Hoffman and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a Martian Sunday colder than a well digger's toes and topped with pop rocks, strawberry and cherry syrup extrusions, Sprinkles of meteorite red hots from the interplanetary concession stand out in the asteroid belt, and a surface dotted with perhaps signs of life. To Ben Bova and Les Johnson, authors of new hard science fiction interplanetary adventure, Rescue Mode. Please join us here next time at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.